Meet SAE International. You might not know us, but we've been with you. For the past 100 years, we've been revolutionizing transportation and mobility, partnering and supporting the dreamers, innovators, and can-doers who are changing the world. It's the child whose future career as an engineer will be shaped by our STEM education programs. It's the businesswoman boarding her flight with peace of mind, knowing that our committees have created the standards that ensure she gets from Detroit to Delhi and back again safely. It's the parents-to-be who are sleeping soundly, knowing that their electric car is fully charged and ready when it's go time. Driven by a passion to advance mobility knowledge and solutions, SAE's global community of over 200,000 engineers, technical experts, and volunteers continues to develop and curate the most reliable and comprehensive collection of engineering resources and consensus-based standards on Earth. The next mobility revolution is upon us. Connected and automated, electrified and sustainable. SAE will be here, as we have for the last hundred years moving the world forward. Welcome everyone to the Formula SAE Alignment Overview presentation. Uh, thank you for joining us today. And a big thanks to the uh, SAE Detroit section uh, in partnership with the SAE Carolina section for hosting this event. Um, I'm Tim Drotar, I'm gonna be your moderator. Um, a little background about me. Um, I'm uh, currently a lead engineer in advanced vehicle dynamics at Stellantis. Uh, prior to joining Stellantis, I, uh, I spent 30 years at Ford Motor Company where I was involved in uh, chassis systems and vehicle dynamics for passenger cars and light trucks. Um, like you, I'm a member of SCCA or SAE, SCCA, um, I'm also a member of the Tire Society. Uh, I've got a BS in mechanical engineering from Lawrence Technological University and an MS in mechanical engineering from um, University of Michigan Dearborn. Uh, shameless plug. Um, I also teach a couple of classes for SAE uh, Advanced Vehicle Dynamics and uh, Fundamentals of Steering Systems. So uh, before we start, I uh, want to address a couple uh, housekeeping items. You know, um, you're all going to be automatically muted uh, with your cameras off. Um, we encourage you to use the chat function to ask any questions you may have. Um, I'll, uh, you know, try to answer some as we go along. Um, some we may save to the end and, and, and our uh, presenter, uh, Daryl Hancock, can, can answer those as well. Um, so you can start right now, at, at, you know, submitting questions. Um, so we'll, we'll take your questions, ask them to the presenter at the appropriate time. Um, this presentation is being recorded and it is it will be posted on the uh, SAE Detroit section YouTube channel at a later date. So uh, today we're, we're blessed to hear from uh, Daryl Hancock Jr., who was a uh, steen, senior technical specialist in vehicle dynamics uh, at Stellantis. Um, Daryl's gonna introduce uh, alignment terms and explain their effects on steering and handling. Um, and he's going to answer any of your uh, live questions uh, today. So, hey, Daryl, uh, welcome. Uh, thanks so much for being here today and uh, in, in sharing your uh, experience and knowledge. So uh, with that, uh, take it away. Okay, thanks, Tim. Let me uh, share my screen. Or you, you're seeing my screen now, okay. Um, I'll shut the distracting video off. Um, so we'll, we'll get rolling here. Um, this is a little more than what, what you would normally think of alignment as. Um, this is going beyond um, just caster, camber, and toe, the kind of thing you get set at your local car dealer or tire dealer. A um, little more in-depth. And it also lays the background for, for a couple of upcoming presentations that Tim is going to do, one on tires and one on uh, the kingpin axis. So this will be kind of the foundation for those. And then he will go into do far more in better detail um, than I will in this one. So to get things moving, just quick background on me. 
I'm a senior technical specialist, again, at Stellantis. Um, I've been an SAE member for 42 years now. I joined as a freshman at uh, Rose Holman Institute of Technology. I've worked, uh, I'm not seeing the shared screen. Okay, let's try this again. <clears throat> And uh, okay, so we got the screen now. Um, I've, I've spent my pretty much my entire career in and around either chassis or vehicle dynamics. So I got uh, about 40 years of experience doing this sort of stuff. Um, and hopefully I'm smarter than most of you are and can answer your question. And again, please uh, answer, ask your any questions you have in the chat. Um, ideally, Tim will be able to answer those on the fly um, as I'm going through the presentation. If not, uh, he can interrupt me and I, I can uh, try to address your questions myself. But the more questions, the better, and we'll, we will do our best to try to answer them. Okay, so now to dive right in. Um, we have a bunch of topics today. I won't go through the whole list, uh, but it's more than just the classic faster camber and tow. Um, and again, it's to try to lay the foundation even for some, some suspension design decisions. So my definition of alignment might be a little more uh, uh, complicated or comprehensive than what you're used to, but it's it's the orientation of the wheels in three dimensions, in all six degrees of freedom, basically, relative to the ground and to the vehicle chassis. And while you're driving it, while the suspension is going through all of its, its motions, so not just what's, what gets set on the alignment rack or, or in the shop with the strings, right? It's, it's what the driver experiences while he's out on the track. So it's a combination of static alignment settings, uh, the suspension geometry, things like toe curves, camera curves, and then the compliance or the, the stiffness of the suspension and the chassis that it's attached to. So if you, if you think about it, alignment is pretty key to ste steering and handling because the car is gonna go where the tires are pointed, right? So that's what this is, is all about today. Okay, again, that real world alignment that the car and the driver experience is the combination of those three things. And they all need to be uh, optimized to make the car handle as, as best as possible. So this slide is more of a reference. I'm not gonna spend much time on it, but we will discuss pretty much all the terms on this slide uh, today. So you can use this as a reference um, to go back and, and get a quick summary of, of what these terms are. So starting out with, with alignment parameters, uh, probably the easiest one is toe. That's the direction the tires are pointed. Um, if you look at them in the top view, when the fronts of the tires are closer together, that's toe in. When the fronts of the tires are further apart, that is toe out. Um, you can describe it both as individual toe, the, the angle of one tire relative to the center line of the vehicle, or total toe, which is the combined angle of the two tires relative to each other. Um, typically in the automotive industry, we talk about degrees. In racing, you typically talk about inches or millimeters of toe measured with a string and We'll talk about that on the next slide. So when you, you talk in terms of millimeters or inches linear measurements, what you do is you have two references, one on each side of the car, um, typically a string held taut, and you measure from that string to the front edge of the rim and to the rear edge of the rim and subtract that value to get the toe uh, for that tire in inches or millimeters, whatever units you want to use. Um, and again, you can have individual toe or, or total toe. Um, keep in mind that, that this alignment setting is tied to the rim diameter. So if you try to compare your alignment settings with a 10 inch rim uh, to another team that uses a 13 inch rim, they're not really the same. That's where using degrees is, is handy. And it's also good to use degrees because the tire data that you get will all be expressed in terms of degrees. Um, so degrees is probably the better way to express it. Um, linear measurements are the easier measurements to make. So it's pretty easy to make a conversion chart in Excel or formula in Excel. But uh, I tend to use degrees, and although you will probably measure in inches or millimeters. 
Okay, so for race cars, uh, your typical static, you know, set in the shop toe settings are somewhere between minus one and one degrees of total toe in or toe out. Um, negative would be toe out, positive would be toe in. Typically, and this is not an across the board absolute uh, rule, but toe out's used in the front and toe in is used for the rear. Toe in generally gives you some stability. Um, toe out reduces the stability and therefore enhances response. So toe out in the front will help the vehicle turn in from going straight, initiate the turn into a uh, curve. Uh, toe in in the rear will help restrain the, the yaw of the vehicle. So those are typical values and typical applications, but by no means hard and fast rules. Okay, so getting beyond the static alignment settings, every suspension has some kind of toe curve. And this is just some examples from production cars, not race cars. Um, typically they go between these two quadrants because that will give you understeer and roll, which is a stable condition that's very desirable for a, uh, a street car. Um, you see one exception here where this, this vehicle has very, very little toe, essentially none. When you think this is a half a degree angle, quarter of a degree angle, so this is less than a tenth of a degree toe change with all the suspension travel. That's probably more along the lines of what you would look for in a Formula SAE car. Okay, the second uh, parameter is camber. It's the front view angle of the tire relative to the, the center line, the vertical center line of the vehicle. So if you have positive camber, the tops of the tires are, are tipped out. If you have negative camber, the tops of the tires are tipped in, um, which would be the more common uh, practice in, in racing in high performance cars. There's also cross camber, the left versus the right, probably something you won't have to deal with in Formula SAE but that's used in uh, oval track vehicles. And it's also occasionally used on uh, street vehicles when we don't have a purely symmetrical line. <laughs> so typical caster angle or camber angles are zero to two degrees negative. You might go a little bit higher. You very rarely will go positive. Um, increasing the negative camber, so a more negative value improves your steady state handling due to the camber thrust that the tires produce. And, and Tim will talk about that in his uh, tire overview. Um, as you tilt the tires in towards negative camber, they each produce a thrust. That thrust opposes each other. So when you drive straight down the road, the car goes straight. Uh, but as soon as you start to transfer weight from one tire to the other in a turn, the tire with the higher vertical load or higher weight on it will produce more camber thrust and therefore steer the vehicle um, in the direction of the, the camber. So if you have negative camber on your outside tire, uh, it gains load, it steers the vehicle into the turn. So that helps your, your cornering force. Um, increasing negative camber though, can be a, an issue when you're braking or accelerating because now the tire is not vertical and square and uniformly in contact with the road. So there is a trade-off between steering and handling and braking and acceleration there. There's a compromise to be made between those. Um, if you have a camber curve that that does not increase camber with jounce, uh, or that increases camber with jounce, then that may hamper your braking. As the car dives, the front suspension moves into jounce, you get more camber and you lose some of that contact between the tire and the, and the road. Um, if you go to larger camber settings, they can cause your tires to wear faster and unevenly. And with very large camber settings, if you hit a, a one wheel bump in the road, then those camber forces are no longer equal between the left and the right tires and the vehicle will dart from side to side uh, when hitting bumps or, or undulations in the road. Um, negative camber also counteracts the camber change with body roll, which we'll slow, show in a couple slides. As your body rolls, it tends to take the, the tires with it. They tend to roll with the body, um, which moves the outside tire more in the positive camber direction. So by having some negative camber initially, you can maintain some negative camber and roll. Uh, most suspensions have a camber curve. 
that increases negative camber, the camber goes more negative in jounce, but it's typically not enough change to offset the body roll. So if your body rolls one degree, you may have enough camber change that your tire only changes by three quarters of a degree or half a degree to offset that, that body roll, but typically not um, enough to 100% correct for body roll. Okay. So here are some uh, typical camber curves. Um, you will have something designed into your suspension. There's no magic. There's no one right single answer. Um, typically, you want to be in these two quadrants. As you go into jounce travel, as your wheel moves up, you want to have more negative camber. Um, and then as you go into rebound, you want to have more positive camber. And don't, don't get real worried about the extreme values and rebound because when a tire is that far into rebound, it will have very little load on it, but so doesn't have a big effect. So hooks in the curve like this are not, uh, not nearly as important as having a relatively flat curve up here. Okay, so I mentioned the camber and roll. So here's a picture of this vehicle is going around the corner and you can see the body is rolled to the right by a little bit. Um, and you notice the wheels have kind of gone with it. The, this wheel has tilted to the right like the body. And then this outer wheel has also tilted to the right into positive camber. So now you have camber thrust from this inside tire in this direction. And you have camber thrust from the outside tire in this direction, which is, is driving you away from the corner. You would rather have negative camber on your outside tire and positive camber on your inside tire so that your camber thrust is a, is a net vector inwards towards the turn. Um, so that's, that's ideal, but it's difficult to do with suspension design and having a vehicle that operates well on bumps or uh, changes in load in the road. Okay. okay, so now inclination angle, which is very similar to camber, um, it's more of a, a semantics difference, but it's important. Inclination angle is the front view angle of the tire relative to the road surface. You said camber was relative to the vertical center line of the vehicle. Inclination is relative to the road surface. So if you're on a, a flat and level road, inclination angle and camber angle are exactly equal. Where it comes into play is if you have a, an uneven road, a crown road, for example, like this, now the inclination angle is relative to the perpendicular to the road surface and, and can be a significantly di different value than the camber angle relative to the, the vehicle center line. Well, in inclination angle matters because that's what determines the tire force produced. The tire uh, contact with the road surface is what determines the camber thrust of the tire higher experiences, not the angle relative to the vehicle. So that's just kind of a, uh, a definition, some semantics there, some details. Okay, next up is the kingpin axis. That's not really part of the conventional alignment definition, but it has a huge effect on the, uh, the in-service alignment of your vehicle. <clears throat> the kingpin axis is the, the axis about which the vehicle steers, about which each wheel steers. Um, sometimes it's called the steer axis. And uh, Tim will have a whole nother overview just on the steering axis and parameters related to it. You have a McPherson strut, which not many FSA cars do. It's from the, the axis is drawn from the upper pivot, pivot point through the lower ball joint. Um, in a short long arm suspension, more common in FSA, it's a line drawn between the upper ball joint and the lower ball joint. So that's the definition of the kingpin axis. We typically talk about side view and front view of the kingpin axis. So the side view of it, looking straight into the side of the car is called caster. Um, caster is 99% of the time positive, meaning the upper part of the, the steer axis is tilted rearward in the car relative to vertical. So typical static caster settings are two to five degrees positive. Again, not a hard and fast rule. Um, don't take that as gospel. That's just common. 
if you increase the positive caster, it, it makes a vehicle tend to return to straight ahead. You know, you've all turned the steering wheel and let it center itself back up. Caster has a big effect on that. Um, caster also causes a change in vertical load on the front tires as you steer. Increasing the caster increases the magnitude of that vertical load change. Um, and the, the effort to do that comes from the, the steering input of the driver. So more caster changes the load on the front tires more, jacks the front of the car up, and the, the force to do that has to come from the driver turning the steering wheel. So increasing caster increases steering effort. Right? Um, and then if you don't have enough positive caster, if you had, say, one degree of positive caster, when you hit the brakes as the vehicle dives, the whole vehicle rotates and that caster angle can go to zero and even become negative. Um, and kind of the, the converse to caster, positive caster, making the vehicle straight, want to straighten itself back out. Negative caster makes the vehicle want to diverge from straight ahead. So if you don't have enough positive caster to offset your maximum brake dive, the car will get very unstable under hard braking and want to, to dive side to side. Uh, not, not a good condition for the driver. And then uh, this statement, unless you use an offset spindle, increasing caster also increases mechanical trail. So I haven't told you what an offset spindle is yet or what mechanical trail is. So just, just hold that thought for a minute, we'll get to it. Um, and then if you increase the caster, it changes camber change in a turn. And I'll show that on the next slide. But the camber change is the negative of the caster angle times the sine of the steer angle. So if you have positive caster, again, which 99.9% .9 of vehicles do, you will get negative camber as you steer, which is a good thing as we just discussed a few slides ago in camber having negative camber on the, the outside tire, which would be the tire that goes into toe in, is a, uh, is a help for cornering. Generates more force to, to help the car turn. Okay, so the reason this works is if you imagine here's your steer axis, here's the spindle, so your, your tire would be mounted out here. Now as I steer back and forth, that spindle is gonna swing through this red circle. And if I could turn to a full 90 degrees, then my camber change would be equal to whatever my caster angle is. If I had three degrees of caster angle and I could steer a full 90 degrees, then I would get three degrees more negative camber, which would be helpful in a turn. Obviously, you can't steer to a full 90 degrees, but the principle holds it at smaller angles. So here's just a simple plot of it. As I make a left turn over here, my inside tire, my left tire goes into positive camber, but my outside tire, my right tire goes into negative camber. So this helps me in my cornering. So that's a good thing. Okay, most vehicles have some kind of cam or caster curve. It uh, is generally a fairly straight line through these two quadrants so that as you go into jounce, you gain um, you know, a couple of degrees of caster. And that's again to give you that braking stability to offset the body dive uh, when you hit the brakes. Okay, now going back a couple slides when I mentioned mechanical trail. What mechanical trail is, if I take my kingpin axis going through my upper ball joint, my lower ball joint, and then project it down to where it meets the ground, the distance of that intersection from the, the center, the geometric center of the tire, is called the mechanical trail. So if I were to add more, more caster, then that intersection would move further ahead and I would get more mechanical trail. So the mechanical trail and caster are pretty directly related. There is a way to, to separate that out. You can have what's known as an offset spindle so that the steering axis does not go directly through the center of the tire. That will shrink your mechanical trail by whatever this, this linear offset is here. So that's a way you can decouple caster from mechanical trail. All right, then another note on mechanical trail. It's a function of both the caster angle here and the diameter of the tire. If you have a bigger tire, 
this intersection projects down and your mechanical trail gets bigger. So it's not a not totally a suspension parameter. It also depends on the size of the tire you're using. But why does mechanical trail matter? Um, it has to do with the forces generated by the tire. The tire will generate a force a slight distance, a cornering force slightly behind the center of the contact patch. Um, that distance is called the pneumatic, pneumatic trail. It's a tire property. Again, Tim will cover that in his uh, overview of tires. And then your mechanical trail is the distance from the center to that kingpin in intersection. So now you have a force, some distance from a, an axis that creates a moment. And that will want to steer the car back to straight ahead. And the harder you corner, the more this force is. The, the larger that moment becomes and the harder it is, or the more steering efforts required, the harder it is for the driver to steer. So mechanical trail plays right into those steering efforts and the feedback that the driver gets. Uh, but it's not the only thing, this pneumatic trail, which is a tire parameter also contributes. Okay, and again, unless you use that, that spindle offset, caster and mechanical trail are directly related. You can't get more of one without more of the other unless you apply a, an offset. As you increase mechanical trail, the vehicle wants to straighten back out because that moment about the kingpin axis increases. Um, so it increases steering effort, but it's also part of the feel, right? The driver will get back to the steering wheel, how hard the tire is, is gripping the road. And as you approach the limit, the tire grip will start to decrease and, and the driver will get feedback through the steering wheel that, that he, he's reaching the limit of cornering. Okay, next term, kingpin inclination. It's the front view angle of that steering axis or kingpin axis, right? You draw the line between your upper and lower ball joints and how far that is tilted from vertical is the kingpin inclination, sometimes abbreviated KPI. It's almost always positive, tilted inwards at the top, um, and it generally results from packaging. To fit the brakes and the upright and everything into the wheel there, you generally have to tilt it inwards a little bit. Okay, so again, it depends on suspension design and packaging. Um, it also increases steering effort, increasing that kingpin inclination, increasing steering effort due to jacking of the front of the car. Um, and it, it also improves, increases the tendency of the vehicle to straighten out. It wants to unjack itself and get back to straight ahead. Um, so when you, much like caster, when you increase kingpin angle, it affects camber, although it affects it in the other, in the opposite way. So here's the equation. That's pretty straightforward. Don't need to uh, work through that. So in kind of a similar way, Here's my kingpin inclination. My steering axis is tilted backwards. Uh, my vehicle's pointed this way. As I steer my tire, you can see this, the, uh, the arc that it moves through is not in plane with the road and it changes the camber. So it shifts camber to positive in either direction. It's different uh, from caster. Then if you combine the effects of caster and camber, Typically, depending on what value of cast or what degree of uh, kingpin inclination you have, you will still see some benefit of, of negative camber on that outer tire, positive camber on the, the inner tire. The effect of kingpin inclination reduces that from the effect of caster alone, but the net is still, still beneficial. Okay, so the next term is scrub radius. Um, if you look at again in the front view, the kingpin axis or steering axis projected down to the ground, um, the intersection, the distance between the intersection of that and ground um, and the geometric center of the tire is the scrub radius. It can be positive as shown here where the steering axis intersects inboard of the tire center line. Here it can be negative where it's it intersects outside of the center line of the tire. Typically, the values are pretty small. Um, 
So this is the next slide. It's a function of the kingpin inclination, the, the offset of the wheel, the location of the wheel, the spindle length, which we'll describe in a minute, and the tire diameter. Um, scrub radius is, is another lever arm about the kingpin axis, and it's where the longitudinal force of the tire creates a moment about the steering axis, which again, the, the driver has to react through steering effort. Uh, so if you imagine this, the tire effort, the, the tire force would be right at the center of the tire and therefore some distance offset from the kingpin axis, you've got a force at a distance that, cre that creates a moment that then the driver has to react through the steering wheel. So if you have very large values in scrub radius, it will make the vehicle tend to pull to the left or the right when brake forces aren't equal. Um, there, there, there are a lot of different scenarios where your left and right brake forces won't be the same, just differences in the braking system, differences in the, the friction under each tire. Um, so large values of scrub radius will tend to uh, make a vehicle less stable under brake. Small values will, will make it much less sensitive to that. There are arguments about why you would want positive or negative. Um, and there's value, valid arguments on both sides of that. And I would say the, the objective is to have a small, either positive or negative value. You generally want to avoid having a zero value because when tolerance is all stacked up, you might wind up with positive on one side of the car and negative on the other side of the car. Okay, spindle length, another term, technically not part of alignment, but it certainly plays into it. It's similar to scrub radius, except it's measured at the wheel center. So the distance between the steering axis and the, the tire center line at the center of the wheel. So it's kind of like scrub radius, but in a different location. Um, it's, it's again, it's, it's kind of baked into your suspension design. You can't independently change it, right? It, it's, a, it's a result of all the packaging. You want to keep it fairly low. Um, in a, in a Formula SAE car that is most likely going to be rear wheel drive, uh, you won't experience torque steer due to it, but in a front wheel drive vehicle, um, that's the lever arm that torque steer acts through to the steering wheel. But in, in a rear wheel drive car, it determines the kickback you'll get from hitting a one wheel bump. If you ever hit a one wheel bump and you feel the steering wheel force in your, in your hands try to move, that's the lever arm for that. Um, so you want to keep that fairly small, but again, it's a, it's a result. It's not a parameter you can really control. It results from where you put the, the ball joints to determine the steering axis and where you have to put the wheel and tire to fit the brakes and the spindle and the knuckle and everything in there. So again, it's not really a design parameter, but it's something to keep in mind. Okay, so now we're getting towards the end. The uh, one of the final things is thrust angle. The easiest way to think of the thrust angle is if you have a solid axle vehicle and you put the rear axle in crooked. So now the drive force from the rear tires is not centered on the vehicle, makes the vehicle want to drive in a, a, a kind of a crooked manner. It doesn't necessarily make the vehicle want to pull to the left or steer to the left or right, but it makes the vehicle drive down the road sideways. You, you've probably all seen a vehicle, typically one that's been in an accident, that's uh, it's driving straight, but it's crooked to the road. You're behind the vehicle and you can see the whole driver's door from behind. So that's uh, what we call dog tracking. Um, and that's a result of the thrusting. But it is not strictly in solid axle vehicles. It's the net toe angle of the two rear tires, right? Produces this line that's the thrust line of, of driving force from the rear tires. So thrust angle, you want to have it as, as small as possible. You want to set your rear toe angles as close to each other as possible. What you set them to is it is a matter of tuning and development, but you want them to be as close to equal left and right to avoid that, that dog track. Okay, so now to the, uh, the last term or the last uh, concept, is Ackerman steering geometry. This is something that is, is uh, hotly debated. I, I see it on Formula SAE discussions. I see it in racing discussions and you will find incredibly passionate arguments 
over how much Ackerman you should have. Should you have negative Ackerman, anti-Ackerman, or what? Um, and I'm not really going to get into that here. I just want to define it and make it clear. So <clears throat> Ackerman geometry causes the inside wheel to steer more than the outside wheel, which makes sense. The inside tire is going around a smaller radius than the outside tire is. So it was originally um, invented to, to reduce the fighting or the scrubbing between the two tires when they're both steered at the same angle in a, uh, in a turn. Um, as the radius becomes smaller, as the gear angles become bigger, um, this, this effect increases. So tighter turns, which there are plenty of in uh, FSAE uh, courses, whether it's the autocross or the endurance course, there'll be plenty of tight radius turns. Ackerman becomes more and more important. So how do you get Ackerman geometry? This is a, a simplification. This is kind of the first order principle, but it's the alignment of the tie rod ball joints to the steer arm with the kingpin axis. So if you project a line through the kingpin axis, through, through the tie rod ball joint, that should intersect approximately at the rear axle for 100%, you know, theoretically perfect Ackerman. Um, so if you have a rear steer vehicle where the rack is located behind the front axle, you, you want your tie rod ball joints inboard more. If you have a front steer vehicle where the rack is located ahead of the, the front axle, you need those, those ball joint points to move outwards. And sometimes there can be interference with knuckles, brakes, wheels, whatever here. So it's generally a little easier to package in a rear steer vehicle. And again, this is for 100% Ackerman, and I'm not gonna say that that's what you want. This is just conceptually how you have it. Um, there, there's a lot of debate over what the right amount of Ackerman is, and it really comes down to your tire and vehicle properties. You wanna make optimum use of, your, your, of each tire so that it, it is generating as much grip as possible, so they will, they will the outer tire will have a different load than the inner tire. The outer tire will need a different slip angle than the inner tire. So it gets very complicated very quickly. Um, and my general guideline is you want to have a fair amount of Ackerman, probably at least 50%. Um, if you really get into your simulation and your modeling and, and do a big breakdown, um, you can probably make a case for exactly how much Ackerman you want to do, you want to have uh, to optimize cornering. But I think it's important to be cognizant of the tight radii on Formula SE courses and the usefulness of Ackerman to, to steer your vehicle around those tight turns. I was expecting a million questions to pop up over Ackerman. Maybe they'll come later. Okay, so now to kind of wrap everything up, um, first of all, the, the orientation, the wheels relative to the vehicle and the road, while you're actually driving it around is what matters. There's no real magic in what alignment settings did you, did you set in the vehicle parked in the shop because you don't drive it when it's parked in the shop, right? It's the actual understanding or the actual condition, understanding and knowing what the operating condition of the vehicle is, right? Because it's going to go where the tires are pointed, right? That's how you steer your vehicle and get around the corner, right? So you need to think a little bit bigger than the conventional definition of just caster camber and pose settings, right? Um, and it's affected again by those static alignment settings, which are important, but also the suspension geometry, the kinematics, the hard points of your suspension and the, the compliance, both the suspension and the, the chassis that the suspension is is mounted to, and uh, don't don't get hung up on this word compliance. It's just stiffness, right? If it's not as stiff, you will get deflections that will change your your alignment of your vehicle, and that's something in in production cars we do very <clears throat> very uh, commonly. We have rubber bushings in there that are intended to add compliance and change the alignment of the vehicle as you're driving it. Um, 
and and for for good reason. That's much less common in high performance and racing cars. Your your Formula SAE cars, the compliance, the stiffness will probably be Young's modulus for steel, right, or, or maybe aluminum, possibly carbon fiber, right. It won't be um, soft like like rubber bushings that we use. Okay, so some references. Um, SAE J670 defines all these terms and many more terms for vehicle dynamics. Uh, there's an equivalent ISO standard 8855 that is very, very similar to SAE J670. However, there's a critical difference in the definition of scrub radius in ISO. It's, the ISO definition is not commonly used the J670, the SAE definition is far more common, but you need to understand which term is being used um, if you're comparing data. And then uh, Hunter Engineering, which makes alignment racks, they have uh, some pretty good stuff on their website. Um, they also have a YouTube channel that shows alignments and it's much more oriented towards production road cars, but it's still, still um, useful. It was also an SAE paper um, written by Bill Mitchell and Alan Stanforth that goes into act, how to analyze Ackerman's theorem geometry. They, uh, they're kind of like me, they cop out on, on how much you want to have, but it's a good uh, explanation of how to analyze it and how to get a certain value, but they won't help you figure out exactly what that value is. Um, and I think that that is a uh, takes a deep dive into your your vehicle and tire characteristics to to optimize it. But having said that, having talked about Ackerman quite a bit, it's not a key thing, right? It's not that that go no go on having a great car. It's not going to turn a bad car into a good car. It's not going to turn a good car into a bad car. It's an incremental thing um, that you can optimize. Okay, so that's pretty much it. Um, looks like we have some pretty good questions here and, and maybe uh, Tim has answered some of them on the fly. Yeah, uh, hey, Daryl, the, uh, the only thing I, I would add to your list of references is um, you forgot to add the Fundamentals of Vehicle Dynamics by Gillespie. Um, because a lot of, you know, what you talked about here, the equations and so forth are, uh, you know, it's spreadsheet engineering and there's a lot of good uh, um, you know, information in the, in the Gillespie book that you can, that, that you can use to, to analyze um, your suspension. So, Yeah, that, that's a good point. It's, it doesn't go real deep into alignment per se, but obviously alignment's baked into everything there co-curves and everything else. And yeah, I, I agree, Tim. I highly recommend that book. If you're going to buy one book to uh, use to design your FSAE card, that is the one. I uh, I actually own four copies of it. Uh, <laughs> one at each of my offices and two at home. So very, yeah. very worthwhile investment in that book. Yeah. And and the other one is, is well, there's, there's just many books, um, you know, good books out there. But uh, so um, I think, uh, so some of the questions, um, so uh, Rajan asked, you know, how would you suggest working with driver feedback to narrow down which parameters to adjust? Oh, that's a good question. Um, that will come up in the, uh, the uh, tuning and development um, overview that uh, is scheduled in January, I believe, January 27th. Um, but yeah, that, that's, that is a challenge, right? How do you translate what the driver is feeling and perceiving into a, a toe curve or an alignment setting? Um, so you have to first decipher the feedback from the driver, then you have to understand what, what affects that. And typically when a driver complains of too much understeer, there are several options you could do to decrease that understeer. Um, changing a tow curve might be one way, but that's tough, right? That goes back to redesigning your vehicle. Changing your alignment setting 
um, might be another option or, or changing your shock damping at one end of the car. Um, so that's, that's a whole nother topic. Very good question. Um, but, you know, we could spend the rest of the day talking about that. <laughs> Absolutely. So that, Rajan, that's going to entice you to come back for the uh, <laughs> the chassis and suspension development overview. Cool. Thank you. Um, Dinesh asks, you know, though it's it's not common, but but how does this influence four wheel steering? That's... Yes, um, not common, and the the rear wheel steering really is not that different from the front wheel steering. You apply it differently. Right, you may apply in phase with the front steer, front wheel steer angle. You may apply out of phase with the front wheel steering angle, and it's really a a method to um, impact the slip angle of the whole vehicle, and therefore the slip angle of the of the individual tires, in a nutshell. But again, that's another topic we could spend the rest of the day talking about. Yeah, but it, interesting though, Daryl, you would uh, I know we. Your, your examples were mostly around the, the front axle, but do these parameters, you know, kingpin, uh, kingpin angle, caster angle, scrub radius, do, do these appear on the rear rear suspension as well? They do, um, not, not identically, not, you know, obviously the rear wheels don't go through large steer angles, even, even if you have four wheel steering, the, the steer angles are relatively small. But things like scrub radius and uh, pneumatic trail determine the, the moments about that rear kingpin or steer axis, which then determines the forces going into the vehicle and the stiffnesses you need to, to maintain rear toe, right? But one of the things that, that uh, you, you never want to have is, is a lot of toe compliance in the rear of the vehicle. You want your toe settings to be fairly uh, set in stone, right? And, and you don't want to have a lot of compliance. And there's two, two sides to compliance. One is the stiffness of the, the structure, the suspension, the chassis, and the other is the loads applied to it. So you can reduce those, those moments about the kingpin um, by adjusting cam, uh, scrub radius and, and caster or that mechanical trail. So that effectively increases the stiffness by reducing the load, right? You have a spring rate and you have a load applied and the, the net deflection is what really matters. Got it, got it. Um, anybody else have any questions? I don't, I don't see any in the chat right now. I see uh, Ben Dupree is wanting to, to go into uh, understeer, oversteer, understeer gradient. That's maybe yep. a little uh, beyond the, the scope uh, of today's discussion, uh, but obviously all of these things will contribute to the, the understeer, oversteer characteristics of the vehicle. And going back to that fundamentals of dynamics, of vehicle dynamics book, there is uh, what they call an understeer budget in there that lets you uh, add all these things up and see the net effect on the understeer, oversteer of the vehicle. So none of these things that I've talked about operate in isolation, right? You have camber thrust from having a camber angle. You have a change in camber thrust from having a caster angle. But you also have weight transfer in the vehicle. Um, you have a, a change in the opposite direction of, of camber due to the kingpin inclination, right? So there's, a, there's a, a very simple, you know, spreadsheet kind of budget to add all of these things together and tell you what your that amount of understeer or oversteer is going to be. Um, and that's that's something, you know, you should be doing in your, your design of your vehicle. Um, it's a very simple analysis. It's, it's in a spreadsheet. In that uh, Fundamentals of Dynamics, Vehicle Dynamics book, there are the formulas. Everything is in there that you need to do to create that spreadsheet. Yep. Chapter six. <laughs> Um, I got another question then, Daryl. Sometimes it confuses me, this whole, you know, camber angle versus inclination angle. Um, can you give a, a, an example of, of how it, it would be different? Maybe, like, what about a solid axle? You know, is it, like, or a solid axle in, in, in roll? 
You know, is there, is there a difference between the inclination angle and the, and the camber angle? So a, a solid axle won't roll with the vehicle and its inclination angle and its camber angle will remain constant, you know, through, throughout cornering, steering, whatever. Um, so that's, a, that's kind of a desirable characteristic. Um, also, solid axles will have very little camber change due to lateral force. Um, probably less of an issue in Formula SAE cars, but in production cars, you have uh, lateral compliance that causes the camber to change a little bit when you start to go around a corner and increase the, the load on the suspension. So in a lot of ways, uh, solid axles are very desirable. Um, a friend of mine once said, we designed these super sophisticated rear suspensions with multiple lengths, and then we try to make them act like a solid rear axle, um, <laughs> which is, is very true. The, the downside to having a solid axle is comes in, I'll, I'll call it ride, but it's not strictly riding. When you have uh, bumps in the road in inconsistent road con road surfaces, um, then one wheel bumps affect both wheels, um, and and you can have some uh, dynamic variation. The the axle becomes a sprung mass system on the tires, um, and the the force variation will be much larger than with an independent suspension that has a lot less unsprung weight. So. A lot of people think, you know, solid axle bad, independent suspension good. You know, like, like virtually everything else in the world, there are pros and cons to both. Yep, there are good examples and bad examples of everything. So, yes. Yep, good. Um, anybody else have any, any questions or comments, thoughts? Okay. Well, um, I guess, uh, thanks. Uh, thanks again, Daryl. Uh, really appreciate you sharing your, you know, your knowledge and experience. Um, the, uh, to all our participants, thank you for, uh, thank you for attending. Um, just please remember, you know, to join us for the next virtual event. Um, it's going to be a, uh, formula SAE, uh, tire force and moments overview and that's going to be Friday December 9th um, you can go to the saedetroit.org webpage click on the register button just like you did uh, for, for this one um, that presentation is going to discuss it basic you know lateral and longitudinal uh, force behaviors and and uh, of the tires um, hopefully give you some useful information as to how you can um, process and, and, and utilize the, the TTC tire data that, uh, that, that you have. Um, you know, thank you again to, uh, to all our participants for, for joining our alignment overview today. Uh, special thank you to, to Daryl, our, our presenter today, uh, the SAE Detroit uh, section staff and the SAE Carolina staff for their involvement in, uh, in putting together today's presentations. Um, if you have any questions or inquiries about this, uh, please e email the SAE uh, Detroit section staff at events um, at sae-detroit.org, uh, shown on the screen. Um, and, uh, you know, if, you, if down the road you, you watch this YouTube video, please continue to consider liking the video and, and subscribing to the, uh, to the YouTube channel and, and sharing with, with someone you might find it useful. So uh, with that, if there aren't any other questions, we'll, uh, yeah, we'll close this out and uh, hope to see you again on, uh, on Friday, December 9th, where you talk tires. I might add that uh, Tim will be your presenter for those next two uh, overviews, the tire and the kingpin axis overview, so. Yeah. And Daryl um, will sure be the will moderator, be much better. so <laughs> kind of like Laurel and Hardy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you.